Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, January the 5th, 20. 22. Okay. For some reason in the last live broadcast, I said it was 2021. I went back and listened to it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I messed up right there at the very beginning. But so it is 2022. So welcome everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, January the 5th, 2022. It is currently 426 PM central time. And I'm coming to you live from the empty sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church located right here in Ovalo, Texas. And in this broadcast, we're going to return to our discussion about church and state. And let me tell you, part one sparked a lot of feedback and all of it was very interesting, somewhat discouraging and depressing in certain ways. Um, it, it, it's just It's just bizarre because I mean, I guess I should have known, right? If you're going to talk about anything um, that's going to spark controversy in 2022 or at the end of 2021, just talk about church and state. Just talk about the church possibly having a responsibility to be obedient to the state in certain ways. You're going to spark a lot of controversy, even though that's not what I'm attempting to do. I am attempting, and this is becoming a theme today, I'm trying to give everyone a truly theological perspective. I'm trying to make theology central. I'm trying to ensure that you have a theology first world view. And that means theology is the central thing to the way you think about every issue, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's the government, whether it's politics, whatever it is that you look at it from a theological perspective. And how do we look at things from a theological perspective is we go to the scriptures. The scriptures have to form that biblical theological thinking so that we can look at everything in that way. And so many times in our current situation is, I I hate to say this, but I'm going to keep saying it. People are looking at everything, not from a theological perspective. They're looking at it from a political perspective. They're looking, they're looking at it from so many different points of view, but not truly a biblical one. And, but, and here's what happens. If, if you could, if you, if you, if you're talking to Christians and you're like, wait, I don't think that's a a theological biblical perspective. And you quote a scripture almost immediately, they will begin to demonstrate to you or attempt to demonstrate to you. They will try their best to show you, nope, those scriptures don't apply. Those scriptures don't work. Those those scriptures have nothing to do, do with this situation. We can ignore those scriptures. And I, and I just have to ask a very important question, even before I, I kind of get, get us back on the same page here. I think this is very important. At what point, and I think this is just something that we have to consider from a, more from a hermeneutical perspective than anything. At what point do you have license as a Christian to say that scripture, that command right there, not applicable to me? That has nothing to do with me. That only had something to do with the people at that time. Now, this is important because because I've seen over and over and over people grab promises that clearly seem to be directed at specific people at a specific time and see people rip those things out of a context and try to apply them to us. So I see people take promises that clearly aren't for us and apply them to us and then take commands that appear to be for us and say, no, it's only for them. I find it interesting that people that, well, I find it interesting that we have a tendency to grab what we want and apply it to us and then remove what we don't like and apply it to someone else. If we like it and we want it, we apply it. If we don't like it, we simply say it's applicable to someone else and not to us. It's it's just too convenient of a system that I think we have. Hey, I don't like what the Bible says. Well, that's not applicable to me. That's not that, that that's not for me. Well, the Bible seems to say that only a man can be a pastor. Well, guess what? That can't be applicable to us. Wait, the Bible seems to condemn homosexuality. Well, that clearly can't be applicable to us. And I don't know why we stop there. 
Well, the Bible seems to condemn lust. Well, that's not applicable for us. It seems to commit uh, condemn adultery. Well, that's not applicable for us. It condemn, It seems to condemn fornication. That's not applicable to us. No, it's like some things were like, no, that is applicable. Other things are like, nope, that, that doesn't apply. So like what, what gives you license to say that's not applicable? I think we would have to agree that it must be there must be something in the text that would clearly demonstrate, wait a minute, I don't think this is applicable. For example, let me give you an example, all right? There, there either has to be something in the text or there just has to be something that logic and sound reason would help you to, to be able to determine, I don't think that's applicable. For example, when God promised that Sarai, Sarah would have a baby, um, you can't take that promise and apply it to any woman who's currently can't have a baby. Hey, no, no. Here's this promise in Genesis to Abram, to Abram and Sarai, or to a- or Abraham and Sarah. Remember that their names are changed. Um, th- that promise there clearly is not applicable to you. One, your husband's name is not Abraham. <laughs> Clearly, even if it was Abraham, it's not the Abraham being spoken to in the text. Your name's not Sarah or Sarai. Even if it was, it's not the, you're not the Sarah or Sarai mentioned in Genesis. And, and not only that, clearly, not every Christian who claims that promise immediately can just have a child. It doesn't work that way. So I, I think we can, we can determine that God is speaking to a specific people. They're named with a specific promise that clearly not everyone who claims the promise, it is fulfilled. So we, we can start drawing some conclusions. But when we have other scriptures that says, you cannot do this, or this is what you must do, we would have to have something again, clearly within the text to say, that's not applicable. And the reason I'm mentioning all of this is I got lots of emails in regards to a certain text of scripture. And I've been told a number of times this week, either one, not just this week, oh, since, I, since the last broadcast we dealt on this subject, either one, the text that you're referring to is not applicable to us, or it doesn't refer to the government, it refers to the church. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? But this just shows you how controversial this subject is. So let's, let's remind ourselves where we've been, okay? Just, just throwing out some ideas there, okay? And, and these are hermeneutical issues that we're going to have to deal with. And, and we're going to just, we're going to really, what we're going to do in this episode, we're going to really follow kind of the Bible study exercise rules. Well, the Bible study exercise rules are going to be, be applicable. And what do I mean by that? We're going to deal with some how to interpret scripture. And I'm going to approach this like I'm going to do some of the teaching, but I may, may leave some of it for you to work on and for you to struggle with. Because remember, I don't like you to be a passive listener. I like, I like you to be an active participant. But I think this is really going to come down. This is really not about church and state. This is really about biblical hermeneutics. This is really about how much leeway do you have to be, to say that passage doesn't apply to you. Well, like, look, what, 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 what gives you the right to just say, nope, that's not applicable. And if you can do it there, then can't, why can't you do it at another? Like if you can find one section of a book and say that's not applicable, then why can't you then argue that the entire book isn't applicable? Like what gives you the right to say these four verses are not applicable, but the verses that come before it and the verses that come after, it's applicable. Like you, you, this becomes really suspect and how a lot of people handle scripture, but you'll, this will all make sense in just a minute. All right. So free grace broadcaster, the free grace broadcaster, their latest edition of the free grace broadcaster, which is issue 258, or I should say the latest issue of the free grace broadcaster is called church and state. And the key part, the key part of a verse that they quote right here on the cover is Romans 13, 1. The powers that be are ordained of God. And in this issue, they're dealing with all kinds of things related to church and state and all of the conflict and issues that arise from this subject. And these is very, this is very relevant in 2022. Not tw- well, it was relevant in 2021 as well. In 2022, it's very relevant because there's so much division and hostility 
towards the government. There's this idea that the government is out to basically destroy Christianity and we've got to stand up and we've got to fight. Again, I even heard on Christian radio the the possibility of us even taking up arms to fight the government, literally on Christian radio. That's how crazy this whole thing has become. And so I think it's a very timely issue. It's one that we want to really talk about. I wanted to get really into the issue and do more taking apart some of the things they have to say. But of course, the very first thing that... (laughs) They bring up Romans 13 and that's when ev- that's where everything then immediately that's that's just well, that's that's it. You just mentioned Romans 13 now and you find yourself in the midst of a controversy. It's just l- literally no Christians can agree on Romans 13. That's 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 where we've at. Tw- we're over 2000 years into church history and we still can't agree on Romans 13. We, we, we I, I mean, I, it's just absolutely Sometimes you just have to ask yourself, what can we agree? What scripture can we agree on? Can anyone name a scripture we can agree on? Can we agree on any of them? And I don't think we can. And that is just so not, that's not a good, that's not a good thing. I don't think anyone should be able to say that's a good thing. That's not a good thing, but we're going to work on this. So here, here's what we're going to do. The Free Grace Broadcaster in their very first article in issue 258 is called Of the Civil Magistrate. And they quote from the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1677 and 1689. Now, that don't give the full section or the full chapter from the London Baptist Confession of Faith. So I thought it would be great to then just not just read what they have to say, but actually go to the London Baptist Confession of Faith. And that's what we did. And where did I put it? Where is the London Baptist Confession of Faith? It disappeared. Give me one second. Here it is. Well, I've got like 900 articles open. All right. So London Baptist Confession of Faith. Let me find here the uh, the section. Here we go. Let me find it here. I can just go all the way here to the top. Okay. It is chapter, what chapter is it? Uh, it is chapter 24 of the Civil Magistrate. Okay. Chapter 24 of the Civil Magistrate. All right, I just have to get down to the chapter. They don't have this uh, hyperlinks where I can just click on it. All right, there's sanctification, saving faith, repentance unto salvation of good works, of the uh, perseverance of the saints, of the assurance of grace and salvation, of the law of God, of the gospel and the extent of the grace thereof, of Christian liberty and and, uh, liberty of conscience, of religious worship and the Sabbath day, I'm getting close of lawful oaths and vows of the civil magistrate, all right? And the first paragraph of this chapter reads like this. Paragraph one, God, the supreme Lord and King of all the world has ordained civil magistrates to be under him over the people for his own glory and the public good. And to this end has armed them with the power of the sword for defense and encouragement of them that do good and for the punishment of evil doers. Now, there are more paragraphs here, but we can't get past paragraph one because paragraph one, the scripture it uses as its proof text is Romans chapter 13. So let's go to Romans chapter 13. We talked about this last time. Oh, this is going to get interesting. Romans chapter 13. (laughs) Oh, it's going to get interesting. All right, Romans chapter 13. Here we go. I'm just going to read it to you one more time. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Let every soul, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, let's just stop here. Let's not even worry about let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Let's not even worry about that, right? Because a lot of people have all kinds of ideas on, well, that's not applicable, and we're going to get into that, okay? So let's just ignore that for now. This is clearly establishing that there is no, that, that, uh, There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. This seems to establish, now not everyone even agrees on this, that this is referring to the fact that God ordains the civil authority. He puts it into power. So when you look at whatever civil authority you see, God put it there. You may not like it, but God put it there. 
You may, you may say, well, it's a horrible authority. God still put it there, unless you believe God is not sovereignly in charge of all things, and all things work according to his good purpose and his will. All right? But this text seems to make it clear it's there. Now, some are arguing, and I've got an article. Uh, I think I've got at least one article on this. Hey, no, 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 no. That's not civil authority. This is referring to the church. God puts the church in power. Now, right there just seems like total insanity, but just to show you how and people are pulling out everything they can to get out of having to follow this verse. They're like, we don't like the current situation. We don't want to follow this. We don't want to follow this. It's just, it's just, it's really crazy. It's really crazy, but okay. So, but at least it establishes God is the one who puts them in charge. Wherefore, there, who, I mean, not wherefore, whosoever thereof resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, again, some will argue this is not resisting earthly civil authority. This is resisting the authority of the church. And then you're like, well, how much authority does the church have? And well, then that gets into all kinds of, of practical implications as well. But this seems to indicate that God puts the earthly authority in power and you must follow it. And if you resist it, you're resisting the ordinance of God. I mean, that, that's what it seems to say, right? All right. For rulers are not terror of uh, to good works, but are but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt uh, have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Right now, what do we do with Romans chapter thirteen? We have a couple of options here, All right? And I, I've I've heard I've, I've had so many things thrown at me now about Romans thirteen that I'm, I'm all, it almost becomes so you know you almost get dizzy because you're just like basically if you need this is what I've discovered if you need an interpretation to give you freedom to no longer follow the government, disobey the government, not follow a mandate, to rebel against the mandate, there are plenty of Christians now that will offer you that ammunition, all right? If you if you need it, they're there. They're like, here you go, load your gun with this, go resist, go rebel, don't follow because you don't have to because people have misinterpreted Romans 13 to you. So anyone who says, submit to the government, God placed that government in power, you have to submit to it unless there's some extreme cases, and those cases are outlined in other parts of the Bible. In other words, they forbid you to preach in the name of Jesus. They, they forbid you to pray. There are certain things like that that you can disobey. Other than that, the rules are, seem pretty straightforward. If anyone tells you that, this is basically the way it's working now, they are wrong, and now here's the new, better, improved interpretation. Because that is a crazy interpretation. So now you don't have to follow those rules. All right. So what do we do with this? Well, we've looked at it. And I, 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 I've already kind of given you my thoughts. But we're going to consider an article that was sent to me and see what they do with it. And we're going to kind of go along with this kind of idea that they're going to put forth. Basically, the person who sent me the article, it seems that their argument basically goes like this. Romans 13 was written to a people in a specific historical setting, and it was only applicable to them. It's not applicable to you or me in 2022 here in the United States of America, Australia, or whatever country you're in. This had everything to do with them. Now, I'm assuming that other parts of Romans, they would say is applicable to us. But this is a specialized section only for people in a certain historical situation, and it's no longer applicable to us. That is the claim. That's a big claim. Now, anybody can make that claim, right? A, a woman can say, well, that those verses about a, a man being a pastor, those are no longer applicable. And I mean, you could, uh, homosexuals could say, well, that's no longer applicable. Those, those verses that seem to condemn homosexuality. I mean, you basically at some point could just argue, well, the, the entire Bible is not applicable, but it is amazing. It's still applicable when it comes to things like, I don't know, salvation. <laughs> that's applicable, but, but in this case, it's not. So we're, we're going to have to see, well, let's, let's, let's go to this article and try to consider this and and see, we're going we're gonna to consider all of the claims 
I've got a lot of resources here next to me that we're going to work through and we're going to see what we can do. So let's find this article here. Um, see here, I've got so many articles here. Okay, here we go. This is the one we're looking for. All right. The name of the article is Romans 13, reading an abused text of scripture rightly. Romans 13, reading an abused text of scripture rightly. So th their claim is that Romans 13 has been abused and now they're going to help us read it in the right way. So has it been abused? I think we could argue that every passage in the Bible has been abused in some way, shape, or form. But who is abusing it? Who are the guilty parties? Who are the abusers of Romans 13? Is it those who say, no, the text says God ordained the power. You must submit to the power unless these other biblical examples of, of disobedience, unless that occurs, unless it reaches that level, then you can disobey. Other than that, you have to obey. Are they the ones abusing it or the ones saying it's no longer applicable or that's not referring to civil government, that's referring to the church? Are they abusing it? Who are the abusers? Well, let's see which argument that they put forth here. Now, I'm just going to read a little bit of the introduction here, just a little bit of the introduction. I'm going to skip a lot of words and, and add my own words just to get us the basic idea because we worked through this last time. But let's go through this. The study of Romans 13 rests upon a crucial presupposition. Without context, words mean can mean anything and everything and therefore mean nothing. It is only through the influence of context that words, phrases, sentences, and paragraphs are endowed with significance. Now, I want to make this very clear. Everyone says this. It's pretty common for people in the church to say, yes, you got to read the text within, uh, you got to put the, the text in its proper context because without the proper context, it does not have proper meaning. That's a common thing for people to say. I remember Harold Camping saying, the Bible must be understood in its right context. It must be understood verse by verse in its right context. And the Bible is, its, is the best interpreter of the Bible, so you got to compare Scripture with Scripture. He said all of the right things. And then the next thing out of his mouth was, the world's going to end in 1994 and Jesus is going to come back. And then the next thing he was telling you is you have to abandon the local church because if you stay in the church, that's taking the mark of the beast and the church ages over over, flee the local church. If you stay in your church, you are basically condemned. And like on and on and on. While he kept saying, understand scripture in its context. <laughs> okay. And don't tell me he wasn't saying that because I was a student of, well, the family radio school of the Bible at the time when all of this chaos was ensuing. All right. And I could take you through the courses I learned on biblical hermeneutics from family radio, where they here are the correct, and the principles of hermeneutics was great. Well, he claimed to be following said principles, he was literally losing his ever his mind about these issues about when Jesus was going to return. And then when 1994 didn't happen, then it was a date in the 2000s. And then it was just, it was just a horrible, sad affair. So I, I, it's great that they start off going, we must understand the words in their context. I agree. So here's the question. If we put Romans 13 in its proper context, can we then say that Romans 13 is no longer applicable to you and I? That, that's a good question. Although the concept seems simple and justified enough, it is often forgotten within the field of biblical exegesis. Due to influences as simple as our, as, as our handling of the biblical text and as complex as the historical theological developments which have dictated how we teach and interpret the scripture. So they're like, there's a lot of reasons that people forget this concept of, of context. It's how we handle our own fluctuation with the text, our own handling of the text, and based off different historical schools of thought that has come, come in. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but just trying to give you the best idea that I can here. Um. He says, so many exegetes, wittingly or unwittingly, ignore context when trying to ascertain the meaning of particular biblical texts. So it's like, hey, it's not everyone's fault, but it's common for people to ignore the context. Now, this person is not supposedly going to ignore the context, and their, their, they, their understanding of the context is going to help us not be abusers of Romans 13. Okay. An adequate case study of this phenomenon is the interpretation of Romans 13 a text that has been used to justify everything from utter obedience to a totalitarian regimes to unquestioning support of harsh anti-immigration laws. 
These seven verses from Paul's epistle to the Romans have been grossly abused at numerous points since their original composition. In Romans 13, 1 through 7, Paul exhorts the Roman believers to apply his previous commands towards love, harmony, and peace, and the context of obedience to government, and the payment of taxes. Far from being a comprehensive con- uh, condensation of the apostles' beliefs regarding any and all government past and present, this passage is a specific and historically conditioned pastoral address to the Roman believers, discouraging them from political unrest, disobedience, and rebellion in order to protect their testimony and the effectiveness of the Roman church and the gospel mission. So this seems to be going in the direction, or at least the way it seems to be going in the direction, possibly, of the idea that, hey, whatever he seems to be saying here, this is for, for, the, for the, uh, the believers in Rome. This is for, for the Romans. This is for them. This is not for us. Now, again, Romans 13 is not for us. Is chapter 14 for us? Is chapter 12 for us? Is chapter 11 for us? Is chapter 10, 9, 8? So when, when, when did the text stop being about us, being for us and being applicable to us? Is, is it applicable or not applicable? If it's not even applicable, then that means, okay, then, well, wait a minute. Doesn't other passages of the Bible say something very similar to what Romans 13 says? And if it does, were, are those passages not applicable as well? But that's some, that's some questions we're going to have to answer here um, over the next however many minutes this takes, all right? <laughs> the next couple of weeks, however long this takes, all right? So the, the, this thesis, so the thesis is that this is basically for Roman believers Uh, This thesis will be proven by appealing to the historical context of the original audience and the overarching context of Romans 12, 9 through chapter 13, verse 10, in which this passage rests. All right, now here we go. Historical context. When Romans 13, 1 through 7 is read as if it was written in modern North American context, it seems as though Paul's appealing to the sovereignty of God and the affair of nations to remind us of the divinely appointed nature of our free market economy and federal constitutional republic. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I will argue, no, when I read Romans chapter 13, I read it as it was addressed to a specific people under a completely different form of government, but the basic principles would still be applicable and how I am to 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 respond to government. In other words, the principles are applicable. The, the, the principles are timeless. God put government in charge and we are to submit to government and it's irrelevant of whether it's North America, South America, it doesn't matter where it is, doesn't matter the kind of government, none of that should even come into, into play here. This is the basic way as believers in Christ, this is how we re- respond to government. It has nothing to do with reading it in a North American context. It's just reading it in the context. I'm a believer and guess where I find myself living? Well, in this world. And guess what this world has? Civil governments. So what is a believer's attitude towards civil government according to the Bible? It seems to be one of submission and obedience, understanding God put it there, not man. That those principles would seem to be timeless not restricted to only the people in Rome because they're repeated elsewhere as we will look in a minute. All right, so let's go on. All of this is supposedly done to prompt us towards active participation in our civil government and unquestioning obedience to all of its laws. After all, these verses come up in discussion of Christian political involvement, debates on just war theory versus pacifism, and diatribes against illegal immigrants and those who desire to aid them. However, using these seven verses as a packet of theology of church and state is problematic. Even within the Pauline corpus alone, the same man who wrote Romans 13 also frequently took up themes in his writings that would challenge the power and authority of the Roman Empire. For the declaration that Jesus is Lord contains the implicit declaration that Caesar is not. Our understanding of these seven verses must therefore be able to mesh with other passages, 
such as Philippians 2, 6 through 11, 3, 20 through 21, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10, and uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, uh, 13 through chapter 5, 11, and their implications on relations between church and state. Now, let's stop right here. Let's just stop right here because this is going to try to create this kind of either or situation. The Romans 13 seems, and I mean, it's just, there's nothing really here to, it's just, sometimes what frustrates me is like the passages that seem to be the most straightforward where it just seems to be explicit what it's saying. Well, like, you know, you really haven't thought this through. So we're going to make this as complicated as we can to demonstrate that we don't have to follow this. And so we're going to muddy everything up. There's nothing to muddy up here. So let me make it this. Let me just try to walk through this as simple as I can. The rules in Romans 13 are very clear. God put the authority and power. Obey it. That's the rules in Romans 13. Now, yes, no one can ignore the rest of scripture. So where do I have situations where people disobey the government. I go and look and make a list. Here's where people seem to be disobeying the government. So you can't preach in Jesus name. I'm going to have to disobey that because scripture says I am to preach and proclaim Christ crucified, resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the father who will come to judge the living and the dead. I am to proclaim the message of Christ. So clearly I can't follow that. You if you're forbid, you can no longer pray. Well, I'm going to have to keep praying because I'm told to pray without ceasing, right? So there are some very specific examples. So typically the rule is Romans 13 is to be followed unless we are specifically commanded to do something which God forbids, or we are specifically commanded to do something which God prohibits prohibits us from doing. In other words, if, if it's telling you, do so, you can't do something God commands you to do, or it's telling you to do something God says you can't do, then you have to disobey. Other than that, you follow the rules. It's not that complicated. I, I don't know why we need to overcomplicate this. It seems to be pretty straightforward. Romans 13, obey, okay. Is there ever a time I can disobey? Well, let's look at some examples. You can't preach in the name of Jesus. Right? Well, we're sorry. We're going to have to keep doing that. You can't pray. Well, I'm going to have to continue to pray because I'm called to pray. I'm, I'm commanded to pray without ceasing, right? You, you, you can't do that. You, uh, we're going to order you to kill your babies. Well, the Bible says that I cannot kill or murder. Okay, I'm going to have to disobey that. There's, those are clear examples. Now, what we want, though, is we want more freedom than that. We want more freedom than that. We want to be able to disobey rules that we don't like. We want to be, so so we we try to find a way to give us more ability to do so. We just go to the, I I don't know why it's so complicated, but all right. Now he does bring in other scriptures and I got no problem. If you got these other scriptures and they clearly demonstrate disobedience to government and their, and their context, like, Hey, they're disobeying, like, proclaiming Jesus as Lord. Well, obviously we proclaim Jesus as Lord because, well, that's what the Bible says. If they say you cannot say that, well, that goes right back to you can't preach in the name of Jesus. The the same concept would be covered under that idea. I still have to proclaim that Christ is Lord, that Christ is God. I have to proclaim these things because they are doctrinally and biblically true. So there I would disobey. So I don't, I've, I've never heard and most of my, in my, in my Christian life, hey, Romans 13 means you can never disobey because no, there's clear biblical examples of people disobeying. You just got to make sure something reaches that criteria. And if it doesn't, then obey. So, so just, just because like, well, they, they disobey over here. So clearly Romans 13 can't mean that. Why, why? Why would you have to draw that conclusion? Romans 13 can clearly say, what it seems to clearly say and just bring in the other passages of scripture and go, now, here's where I can disobey. The rest of the time, this is the default position. That, 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 that's not complicated, but all right, let's go. Many commentators in recent years have recognized the importance of interpreting this passage in light of the historical context at the time of its composition, 
57 AD. Now, I think most agree that it was written somewhere between 56 and 57 AD. All right, now, they're getting ready to make a big deal out of this 56, 57 AD uh, time frame because they're going to say, see, this is the historical context. So because it was written in 56, 57 AD, here's a question. Then is it only applicable to the political environment of 56 and 57 AD? Or is it possible that it was written to give them an understanding of how they're to respond to government, not just in 56, 57 AD, but in 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 60. Are you saying four? Are you saying that the inspired word of God was only giving instructions that were only applicable to that specific time and had no bearing on people ju- just a couple of years from? Then? In other words, a good, a good amount of people who would hear these words would still be alive when things dramatically change. But, but okay, if it changes, it's no longer applicable. Is that, is that the way we're to understand this? Well, let's see where they go here, all right? So many commentar- commentators and recent years, I want you to understand this, many commentators in recent years have recognized the importance of interpreting the passage in light of its historical context at the time of its composition. I wonder what how Christians were interpreting it 300s, 400s, 500s, 600s, 700s. Instead of assuming that these verses are Paul's fundamental views on how church and state should relate to each other. So instead of seeing this as, this is Paul telling us how church and state should relate. This is really just understanding what was going on in 56, 57, 58 AD. That's it. What? That, and how do you prove that? It's just a claim. Hey, this is how you should handle the text. Now, now maybe they're going to prove it. Maybe they're going to prove it. But at this point, I mean, <laughs> it's just a claim. I, I could just as well claim the opposite. Knowledge of the situation facing the Roman Christians in AD 57 is crucial to the interpretation of this text. Emperor Claudius had expulsed Jews from the city of Rome in AD 49, removing Jewish believers from the Roman church and therefore leaving only Gentile Christians behind in their stead. However, Claudius was killed by his wife in AD 54, and her son Nero advanced to the throne that same year, immediately following the Jews, allowing the Jews to return to the city. When Romans was written by Paul in AD 57, the empire enjoyed a period of peace that looked quite different from the chaos that would characterize the later years of Nero's reign. Now, when we say the later years of Nero's reign, I think if you look up when persecution started happening under Nero, if I remember, 64 AD, all right, 64 AD is when persecution really begins. The the first persecution of Christians organized by the Roman government was under Emperor Nero in 64 AD. So if it's 64 AD, it's, the book is written, the letter is written in 57, okay, I'm not great at math, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 60, seven years. Right? So they're like, hey, we, 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 this, this had a very specific, it, yeah, it had a time span of, of, of being applicable for basically six years. <laughs> six years it was applicable. On the seventh, it stopped being applicable. <laughs> right? That, 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 that's interesting, okay? Hey guys, I'm writing for I'm writing this to you to say you could this is only applicable for the next few years. For those who find this later, it's not applicable. But under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that I guess that couldn't be uh articulated. But here we go. All right. So uh let's see here. Uh and, and please note, it says characterize the latter years or the later years of Nero's reign. Again, the later, the latter years are just six to seven years away. It's it's not like, you know, 50 years from now, a thousand years. No, it's talking just in a a few years. The situation is going to begin to to change. Um, Guided by his advisor, Nero made promises of a different and better peace than of Augustus. He promised true peace, characterized by restraint and the peaceful resistance to using force in order to govern. While these promises were dashed beginning in AD 59, uh, 
the loss of his advisors and the beginning of and the beginning of his persecution of Christians is crucial to remember that Paul wrote Rome during the the period of hopeful peace from AD 54 to 59. But if it begins, they, they say these promises are dashed beginning in AD 59 and the beginning of the persecution of Christians. If they da- if they date the beginning of persecution to 59, well, <laughs> And he wrote it in 57. Then you're talking two years later. But hey, he really wrote it during a time of peace. Romans 13, 1 through 7 should not therefore be interpreted as if it were written to Roman believers in the later years of Nero's reign when persecution and oppression were rapid. For this would unduly strengthen Paul's pro-empire sentiments. All right, so, so don't interpret this as riding under bad Nero. No, no, no. This is when Nero still wasn't, hadn't lost his mind yet. He was still a pretty good guy. So interpret it that this only applies to when Nero was doing good, but when Nero turned bad, it was no longer applicable. So in other words, the way you work this is if the government becomes bad, then this is no longer applicable. All right, let, let's just stop right here. Let's, let's go with this theory, okay? So let's say we can throw out Romans 13. Let's just say, you know what? Romans 13 is not applicable. Let's just play this game. Romans 13, not applicable. It's only written to people in Rome during a time when Nero was a good guy, when Nero wasn't so bad, okay? When Nero wasn't going crazy and persecuting Christians. So once Nero started becoming bad and persecuting, then all bets were off. Okay, let's just go with that idea. Now, let's do this. Because I think this will be helpful, right? Uh, Let's... What does the Bible have to say in regards to government and authority? Well, let's look at some scriptures here, right? Oh, here's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom to cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. All right, that's 1 Peter. All right, so we, we, that's basically saying the same thing. Obey, honor the government. Okay, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What was going on when Peter wrote? Hmm. Now, there's some debate here. Some argue for a later dating of 1 Peter, saying that it was clearly written under a time of great persecution. <gasps> wait, what? That can't be true. Peter had to be writing this when when there was no persecution. Everything was great. But if I just reach over here and just grab a Bible dictionary, right? I'm just going to go here, right? The epistles of Peter, right? Historical setting. First Peter is addressed to Christians living in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, uh, and, and so a number of locations, a number of locations, so not just one location, places in the northern and western parts of Asia, Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. The readers appear to have been Gentiles, although they probably had not been evangelized by Peter himself. The letter was obviously written to believers undergoing trials and wait for it, persecutions. Oh, so wait a minute. A letter is written to people undergoing persecutions and they are told to, let, let, let me go back to it. I'm going to go to first Peter now. I'm going to go to first Peter chapter two. All right. And I'm going to go here. Uh, see, I'm in James. I was like, that makes absolutely no sense. All right. First Peter chapter two. All right. I'm going to go to the same passage here. 1 Peter 2.13. This was written to people undergoing persecution. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as to them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For this, for so is the will 
of God. Verse 17, honor the king. Wait, this is written to people facing persecution. So even if you try to find a way to get around Romans 13, the principle shows up elsewhere. Oh, but wait, wait, no, it, it, that can't, is that the only place this occurs? Uh, oh, wait, how about Titus? How about Titus? What is said in the book of Titus? I mean, I, I could I could be completely wrong here, but I think Titus has something to say about this. I mean, let's see here. Titus, let, let's see here. Which, which verses do we want to look at? Let's go to, is it chapter three, I believe? Oh yeah, uh, Titus chapter three, verse one. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates to be ready to every good work. It's telling them to be obedient to the magistrates, to the civil authorities. Now, wait, that's the book of Titus, right? Okay, or the, or the epistle to Titus. Let's, let's look this up. When was Titus written? Let's, let's see what we can find out about Titus. Let's see. Let's see what we can, we can find out. Let's see if this offers us any insight here. Let's look up Titus. Let's go to Titus. All right. Let's see here. What we can, uh, Titus, epistle two. All right. One of the three pastoral epistles among Paul's writings. Oh, we have Paul. We have Paul. All right. Let's see what he has to say here. All right. Uh, historical setting. According to for, uh, t- Titus 1.5, Paul left Titus on the island of Crete to continue establishing churches by appointing elder, elders in every city. All right. Um, the occasion for the letter was clear enough to warn against false teachers. Uh, the precise nature of the teaching was less clear, although it included Jewish fables, legalism, and disputes over genealogies. All right. Um, let's see, do we have a date here? Okay, the circumstances were the same as those under which the Apostle Paul wrote the letters to Timothy. All right, so let's go to Timothy, see if we can get some kind of dating here. See if, if this is going to be helpful or not helpful. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Timothy, Epistles 2. All right. Uh, the authorship and date of the pastoral epistles remain an unresolved question in New Testament studies. All right, so we don't know uh, possibly exactly when this takes place. That's according to, to one source. Let me, let me look here. I'm going to look up in another source. But the fact is, if we don't know, then we, 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 we can't just immediately assume, well, it had to be when everything was going great. It, it, it doesn't always work out that way. Um, let's see here. Um, oh, they have, uh, and this, AD 62 to AD 63. Oh, wait, that's, that's getting into the time when Nero uh, starts acting crazy. Oh, but, but it probably didn't apply to any of these people or, or, or the governments that they were under. Do we have to look at the governments that they were, were under? After Paul was released from Roman imprisonment, described in Acts 28, he engaged in further travel. One stop was Ephesus, where he ministered for a time before traveling on to Macedonia. For Macedonia, Paul wrote to Timothy, whom he asked to stay in Ephesus. Wait a minute. Paul wrote this after he got out of prison, after he was persecuted? Oh, wait, that would seem to apply that he told people to obey the government even after he himself had been arrested for preaching. <laughs> that that kind of starts blowing up the whole theory, doesn't it? Right? Uh, let's see here. Uh, well, we've looked at 1 Peter 2. Uh, let's see, where else do we want to look here? Um, is there any others that we want to look at? I think th- those uh, I think those get us pretty close. I think those those give us we have Paul and we have Peter. Basically, here's what I want you to see. We have Paul and Peter saying the same thing written in different context where there was persecution going on and they had the exact same argument, which is to submit. So even if you throw out Romans 13 and come up with some weird like 
This was only applicable for five years. This had a five-year time stamp on it, right? When, it, when they got the letter, like, you better get that letter out there quickly. This is only good for five years. After five years, that chapter 13, well, they didn't have chapters at the time. That part where I start talking about governmental submission no longer is applicable. Well, if it's applicable when people are being persecuted, the same principles are repeated in other places. How, can, how do you just ignore that? Remember, context. Remember, looking at the rest of Scripture. Oh, well, let's see see where else they go here. Oh, we're going to run out of time. We're going to run out of time. All right, that's okay. That's okay. All right, here we go. All right, uh, so therefore, uh, back to the article. Romans 13 should be interpreted as it were written to Roman believers in the... Uh, Romans 13 should not therefore be interpreted as if it were written to Roman believers in the later years of Nero's reign when persecution and oppression were rampant, for it would would unduly strengthen Paul's pro-empire sentiments. So in other words, if you understand this when persecution was going on, then this would strengthen the idea that clearly the article seems to be, the the, the verses seem to be implying a pro-empire sentiment. In other words, submit to the authority. Well, guess what? Even if I don't have Romans 13, I have Paul telling people to submit even after he was arrested. (laughs) I have Peter telling people to submit, even while they're going through persecution. (laughs) So how how can I just, well, I can get out of Romans 13. That doesn't get you away from the principles. With this background information, it's easy to see why Paul here gives advice to his readers. A a cosmopolitan church in Rome struggling to figure out Jew-Gentile dynamics in the early years of Nero's reign so as to prevent them from drawing negative attention to themselves and damaging the effectiveness of the gospel mission. Although things were presumably going well, as mentioned above, Paul knew full well that things could get tense for the Roman believers very quickly. Despite the period of relatively peace from A.D. 54 to 59, tensions were rising in A.D. 57 through 58 regarding the particular nasty practice of indirect taxation. Uh, Furthermore, the Jewish believers who had returned to the city in A.D. 54 may not have been on the best terms with neither the Roman authorities nor the Gentile believers. Much of what Paul has to say in the epistle speaks to this issue, the relationship between Jews and Gentile Christians within the Roman context. Okay, if much of the epistle is in that context, then can we apply much of the, the scripture, much of Romans to us? Or do we just throw it all out? If Romans 13 is not applicable, then why is the rest of it applicable? Because all of it falls within the same historical context. Oh, we just throw out what we don't like in 2022. Is that, is that, is that the way the game is played? I, I don't know. Let's continue. It is not therefore unreasonable to assume that this played a role in the social tension. Paul addressed in Romans 13. Oh man, that, okay. <laughs> My article just went crazy all of a sudden. I'm like, what just happened? All right, uh, With this background, okay, no. Although things were presumably going well, okay, all right, here we go. Here's the paragraph. It is not therefore unreasonable, the whole article just reloaded. It is not therefore unreasonable to assume that this played a role in the social tension Paul addressed in Romans 13. Furthermore, revolutionary sentiments were in vogue at this time. The Jews in Palestine and Paul was perhaps worried that the fervor would spread to the Roman church and quickly create some serious problems, giving the tensions within the church and its social context. Now, let me, I'm sorry, I almost knocked the microphone over. Let me, let me just say something really quick. I do believe in looking at historical context all day, every day. But let's never forget, whatever the historical context was, we believe scripture is given to us by inspiration of God. So it's not just Paul looking around going, look at this situation. I better tell him what to do. It's God inspiring that those words be written down. So let's not just say, well, that's Paul just realized that there was a problem here. No, it would be God giving the directions through Paul. All right, so let, let's not forget inspiration here. Um, positively then, when Rome, Romans was written, The original audience enjoyed a period of relatively peace and stability before the chaotic upheaval that would take place in AD 59. So they believe it starts in 59. So that means if it's written in 57, two years, (laughs) 
<laughs> it had a two, did it only have a two year lifespan? Hey, you only need to be obedient for two years. Do you think y'all can do that? Do you think you can pull it off? Just two years. That's all that's, that's needed. But wait a minute. Titus, Timothy is written later. So after persecution's already broken out, but, but to people not experiencing it, but Paul himself had experienced it. So like, like you start, it starts all falling apart when you put it all together. All right. Okay. Hang on here. I'm getting, I'm getting a phone call on my iPad. I hate that when that happens in your life on the air. Okay. So here we go. Um, so, uh, so it, everything begins to go crazy in 59 AD. Negatively, there was still quite a bit of tension within and around the Roman church, which had the potential to divide the church and get the Christians in serious trouble with Roman authorities. If rebellion began, became the rallying cry of the followers of Jesus, assured of the lordship of their king and the reality of his kingdom. So like, hey, tensions were building. And if they started having, if they started, started disobeying, it was going to create all kinds of problems. Well, doesn't it always create problems if we start rebelling, no matter what year it is? It is therefore a mistake to read Romans 13 as a justification of the sins of the state, as if this passage gave a, uh, basically, you know, a blank check to the uh, atrocities to be committed in the later years of Nero's reign. Now, let's stop right here. This is so important. If you believe Romans 13 says what it says, it's not giving a blank check to governments to do anything wrong. No, it, that, oh, that's such a, this is such a not being fair. Romans 13 says, God put the power, those those governments in power. If they do wrong, the wrong is still condemned. As a pre, as a preacher, you would still condemn the wrong and the evil. You would say it's wrong to do whatever they're doing. The issue is, what is your responsibility? Well, if they force you to participate in evil and wrong, then you, and if they say, look, we're going to, hey, you're a Christian. We're coming to your church this Sunday. We're going to get you. We're going to give you guns and we're going to have you go out and kill everyone who's a Jew. You have to do it. Okay. Well, now I'm going to have to disobey because you're telling me to kill and murder people, which the Bible says I cannot do. So it's not giving Romans 13 is not giving a blank check to the government. It's saying that God put the government there. Why he puts evil governments in power, I'll never understand. No one will ever understand that. That goes to the sovereignty of God. And that problem begins way before Romans 13. That starts all the way back in Genesis 1.1. Listen to our, our sermons on the doctrine of reprobation, and you'll see where we've talked about all of these issues. So it's not like, oh, no, Romans 13, it's not giving it a blank. No one's giving it a blank check. If the government does evil, you say it's doing evil. The issue is, what is my responsibility to it? To obey said government, unless I'm put in a situation where they force me to disobey God's word. So I, I don't, that's not fair. No, nobody is saying that, that Romans 13 is a justification of, of the sins of the state. Romans 13 doesn't justify anything. It justifies, it states a fact. God put them in power. Obey it. Doesn't say that, hey, they can commit sin and it's not sin. It's never stated in Romans 13. Um, or, or this is somehow giving a blank check to the atrocities to be committed in the later years of Nero's reign. Paul was capable of saying negative things about pagan governments when they were going awry. Of course, Nobody said, no, but nothing in Romans 13 says you cannot preach against the evil the government is doing. Nothing in Romans 13 says you cannot do that. It says you have to submit to it. But other passages told me where there's a limit to that submission. When they come and say, you have to do what God has clearly forbidden you to do. Then we have to draw a line. It's giving you the general principle, obedience is the rule. It's repeated in Timothy or Titus. It's repeated in 1 Peter. That's the principle. That's what we do. Okay. 
But but the never but he nevertheless appealed to God's sovereignty over human government in order to prevent tense situation of his audience from erupting into a social upheaval that would wreck the church's testimony and hinder the gospel mission in the city of Rome and the empire over which the city he ruled. Now I think that same principle is still applicable. Hey, if you run around disobeying everything the government says, it's going to destroy your witness, destroy your testimony, destroy your ability to fill the, fulfill the Great Commission. So you do everything in your power to live peaceably among the world. You try to follow their rules. You try to be a good citizen. You render under Caesar what is Caesar. You do that which is right to the best of your ability. It may come to a point where you have to disobey, and then you disobey in the most godly way possible, dealing with whatever consequences may come. All right. Um, his audience then, and readers of the epistle today, would not therefore be expected to never challenge the government or abstain from promoting or, or participating in its practices, as Romans 13, 1, 7 has often been used to argue. Instead, they were and are wisely interact with human governments, not seeking to cause any trouble in society that would damage their testimony. Amen. Now, 1,000% agree with that, but not hesitating to stand firm in the cause of Christ their king when human government do things contrary to the, to, to the kingdom of God. Uh, and then I'll stop right here. All right. Oh, oh, man, we're already at an hour. Okay, so let me try to make this clear. It's not this black and white either or situation. Here it is. The principles are applicable. The principles are applicable. The principles mean list that we, and, and he seems to even argue that we can, they are applicable today. I mean, he seems to argue that his audience then and readers of the epistles today would not therefore be expected to never challenge the government or abstain. Romans 13 is not saying you can never take a stand. It's saying that the general rule is that God put the power there, obey it. The reason I know that's not the, the end of the discussion is because I've got the rest of the Bible that shows specific cases where, oh, dis, where rebellion or, or, not, or disobedience to the government was not, oh, not only did it occur, it occurs and it is reported as a good thing, not as a bad thing. But those situations are clearly outlined in front of us. You can't preach in the name of Jesus. All right. Sorry. Going to have to do that. All right. Clearly, we profess Christ as Lord. If someone says, I can't do that, that goes right back to that first principle of preaching Christ. Clearly, if they tell me I have to kill someone, that 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 I don't have to follow that rule because I am told not to kill or murder. Now, if you believe the government has the power to to uh, to use the sword to carry out wrath, and that would include war, then it gets into the fact that I would follow the law to carry out war if it meets the just war criteria. That's why that that's why that uh, that concept was established early in the, in the early church is because everyone said, well, the government has the power, but what if the government uses that power to call for killing in an unjust way? Well, then I am to abstain from that. The church, it's never been, now maybe there's some weird situations where this has occurred, but even in the early church, it was like, okay, Romans 13 says we have to obey. All right. They do have the power to use the sword but what if they use it in an incorrect way? What is your job as a Christian? Well, if it's not a just situation, you may have to stand against it. That, that's, that's the way it works. I, I, and I'm just going to read. He quotes from uh, someone by the name of Wright, and he, he, he says, here, this is how he puts all of this together. Precisely because of the counter-imperial hints Paul has given not only in this letter and elsewhere, but indeed by his entire gospel, it is vital that he steer Christians away from the assumption that loyalty to Jesus would mean the kind of civil disobedience and revolution that merely reshuffles the political cards into a different order. The main thing Paul wants to emphasize is that even though Christians are servants of the Messiah, the true Lord, this does not give them a, basically a blank check to ignore the temporary subordinates whose appointed task, whether like Cyrus, they know that, uh, whether like Cyrus, they know it or not, is to bring at least a measure of God's order and justice into the world. 
The church must live as a sign of the kingdom yet to come. But since that kingdom is characterized by justice, peace, and joy in the spirit, it cannot be inaugurated in this present by violence and hatred. I agree with that. The government's been put there to do good, whether they know it or not. They've been put there by God, whether they know it or not. My job is to live out a way that characterizes justice, peace, joy, godliness, and realize that I can't institute these things by force or by hatred or by rebelling against the government. I can't, I can only do that through the preaching of the gospel. So I am called to preach the gospel. I am called to obey the government unless I am forced in very, 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 very specific situations to disobey. And whenever I get ready to disobey, I need to ensure that I have done everything in my power to try to live as peaceably as I can and avoid that situation if possible, not because it's not about my rights, it's about the furtherance of the gospel. So how will my actions either help or hinder the furtherance of the gospel? I have to consider each situation carefully. So he seems to be arguing that it is, a, he's, he's really putting it in a historical context, right? Hey, it's really the historical context. But he seems to acknowledge that there's a part that's applicable for us. Right. So he, he seems to be simply arguing against claiming that Romans 13 is you have to submit in every situation. There's never the time to disobey. Very few people ever say that. We all acknowledge there's times where the Bible shows disobedience to civil authority, but it's very, there's only a few examples of it. So, so even if you try to reduce this to, well, it's a historical setting, the same principle is applied in other historical settings where there is persecution going on. So the principles go beyond 57 to 59 AD. They go beyond that. They go into the 60s. They go beyond that. They go to today. So we have to figure out how they're applicable. I don't know. There's nothing to me. I don't understand what... what I don't even understand what they're trying to accomplish here because they come right back around and basically say, well, they, they, there's still principles here that are applicable. Well, like, okay, either some, either it's all applicable or it's not applicable. Which is it? It says, these sentiments and those outlined above will now be are, uh, augmented by a brief examination of Romans 13, 1 through 7 with the overarching context of Romans 12, 9 through 13. And now they're going to look at the scriptural context. They've given us the historical context which all they've really demonstrated is that the historical context is 57 to 59 AD. That's where it's supposedly applicable. After things got bad, they're, they're, they're supposedly now they don't have to follow, but yet the basic general principles are still applicable for us that we should do everything in our power to follow the rules. So I, I wouldn't it have just been easier to go, here's what Romans 13 says, However, here's some other scriptures that show people disobeying. So how do we reconcile Romans 13 with these other passages? Solution, Romans 13 is the general principle, obey, because God put these governments in power. However, if the governments do the following things, as given here in the book of Acts, or here, Daniel, or here in Exodus, these, these certain situations, then you can disobey, I, he spent a lot of time saying 57 to 59 AD to turn around and say, well, if, if for us who read it today, the general principle is still there. We should do everything in our power to obey so that we don't hurt our testimony. And it completely ignored the fact that Paul gives the same instructions in Titus, which is 60 something AD, Peter, when persecution is going on. So, Why even bother trying to say this is where it's applicable for? Because the same principles are repeated elsewhere in the Bible and other time frames. It just just makes no sense to me what they are trying to do. But now we're at an hour and eight minutes. We're going to have to stop. We'll go through the scriptural context. Look, this is not what I want to do, but it's what I have to do because I'm, I'm getting so many emails about, it's just, you mentioned Romans 13 and everyone loses their minds. It's just... 
I've never seen so much attempt to just say Romans 13 doesn't apply. 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 There's got to be, it's not, you can't do, you can't do handle things that way. Okay, even if Romans 13 doesn't apply, I still got the same principles in Titus and 1 Peter. I still got the exact same principles. Well, no, they don't apply. Well, then let's throw, let's rip out Romans. Let's just rip out 1 Peter. Let's just rip out entire books of the Bible because, hey, we don't agree with Romans 13. Then why agree with anything else in Romans? Just throw it all out. Just throw the entire Bible out. Just do what you want. Because that's basically what it comes down to in, in 2022. Hey, if God's word says something I don't like, I'll just make it go away. I'll do what I want. Well, then why play the game? Just throw it out and do what you want anyway. Then don't, let's not even worry about going through all of these, you know, an hour trying to figure out where you're taking the argument. Let's just make it, just do what you want. Okay, that, that's the Christianity of 2022. Do what you want. And if you want to take up arms against the government, well, I guess there's some Christians will say that that's perfectly acceptable. It's just, I, it's just crazy. And when you go through church history, they, they're constantly trying to go, well, okay, how do we obey here? How do we don't, that there, there's always been a, an attempt to try to figure these issues out. Man, they could have saved themselves a lot of trouble and just say that it doesn't apply. But, but, well, wait, they still got the same principles showing up elsewhere. Uh, very frustrating to try to work through this, but okay. Maybe maybe the article is going to end where we can say we, I mean, and one way I'm, I'm kind of disagreeing with the article and the other way is I'm kind of agreeing with it because he's still making the principles applicable. Just trying to say, well, it's not, it's not total obedience. It's, it's just, you get it. You got to outline it better than that. When can I obey? And when can I disobey? Well, when should I obey? And when can I disobey? You've got to outline it better than that. And then there's no attempt there to even try to explain it. Very, very difficult. But maybe by the time the article is over, we're going to be like, whoa, look at this. This makes perfect sense. Right now, I just don't know how you, you don't look at the other passages that we considered and just spend a few minutes looking up the dating of the books. And you're like, well, there's persecution going on and they're still told to obey. Paul, he was in prison. He gets out of prison and still tells people to obey. <laughs> you know what? Like, uh, how, how, do you, how do you reconcile all of those historical facts? All right, I'll stop right there. Email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. All right, I'll be back on the air soon. God bless.